Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone who linked into our webinar on essential public health functions and how these functions could prevent the next pandemic. I will start with some housekeepings. You are cordially invited to ask us questions. We will start with an interview with Dr. James Fitzgerald and you have the Q&A function and please use it because we will try to get as many as your questions answered. My name is Bettina Borisch. I am the CEO of the World Federation of Public Health Associations and a professor at Global Health at the University of Geneva, Switzerland. I welcome you all around the world who linked in. Never before in my retrospection have public health professionals been so visible to a broader public than in the last months. Let's take Dr. Fauci. He made it on t-shirts, on coffee mugs, hashtags, and even in our small and quiet Switzerland, the person responsible for COVID became a kind of national hero working at the Federal Office of Public Health. Until recently, public health workers were quite invisible and even people in the health, in the broader health field, did not know exactly what the functions of public health people, professionals are. Now, I am here with Dr. James Fitzgerald, Director, Health Systems and Services at the PAHO, Pan-American Health Organization, the regional WHO institution for the Americas. Dr. Fitzgerald, warm welcome. Thank you for your time and thank you for being with us and all those who follow us worldwide. We want to learn more about the essential public health functions and how they can perhaps prevent a next pandemic. So my first question to you would be, what are the essential public health functions? In a nutshell, for those who have not been working intensely on them as you do. Dr. Fitzgerald. Well, a very good morning uh, to you, Bettina, and to all those uh, participating in this uh, session this morning. It's a real pleasure to be with you um, and to have this opportunity to talk about an issue that is so central to uh, public health, to the health of all populations and persons, families and communities, and of course, to the future um, social development um, of all countries uh, globally at, at, at present. Um, we at the Pan American Health Organization have always uh, seen the issue of public health as central to the achievement of uh, our objectives in sustainable development. Um, you asked such a, a key question, and, and you're right in, in what you say in terms of. Um, an understanding of what the essential public health functions are, because uh, as we have seen through the history of them, um, there has been uh, somewhat uh, distinctions in terms of their interpretation, their construction and their application within the broader construct of health and development that has led to uh, difficulties in having a concrete understanding um, of what they actually are. We see the essential public health functions as institutional capacities, the capacities um, of health professionals, of national health authorities, um, but also of all other social actors that have uh, as an objective to improve the health and well being um, of the population um, through not just actions within the health sector but strengthening intersectoral and sectoral actions to address um, health conditions of the population, um, those health conditions uh, in communities where they live, and of course then addressing what we all know as the social determinants of health. 
we see them um, as not just being limited to prevention and promotion in health, disease prevention and control and health promotion, but uh, the provision of integrated public uh, individual and collective health services through which we improve the health status of the population and while at the same time going beyond the health sector into other sectors and addressing the necessary capacities uh, through public policy and through intersectoral action to address the social determinants of health. That seems like a lot, but these are so important uh, to really improving the health condition and health status for populations that we have to, I think, open our minds a little bit more and begin to um, create the necessary capacities across the whole of government, across the whole of all sectors involved in health to improve the health status of the population. And indeed, we've, need, we've seen um, a very important example of why uh, this approach is so important as we look at the successes and somewhat, um, somewhat uh, challenges that we have faced in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you for this very broad definition, challenging. I know you have been working at PAHO on a new version of the definition. What, what is new, what is innovative in your new definition of public health functions at PAHO? Thanks, thanks for that question. I think to explain where we are um, in the region of the Americas, we need to look back at uh, the historical context of the essential public health functions. Um, as you well know, Bettina, the uh, essential public health function was originally a proposal coming out of the US government uh, based on the, uh, a report on the Institute of Medicine in 1998 um, that really called um, on the U United States to really build capacities in public health to address uh, what they considered were the priority uh, challenges in public health at that time. But we have to see what was happening at that time also within the broader context of the history of, of health systems. We had in 1978 uh, the Declaration of Alma Ater on primary health care, uh, which called on comprehensive approach to delivering um, and to addressing health needs based on the needs of the community, uh, within the communities, based on a comprehensive and resolution first level of care um, and expanding into uh, and ensuring the organization of, of health services networks. Central to that was the broader vision of health, not just in delivery of health services, but on the diagnosis, the treatment, the palliative care, and then health promotion and disease control and prevention. Um, so the vision of Alma Ata was very expansive and really uh, in, englobed the concept of, of public health very well. But unfortunately, we, we ran into a situation in the 1980s and 1990s um, where economic conditions didn't really allow governments to expand um, health systems in a manner that would have really allowed us to realize the, the vision of Alma Ata. Um, structural reform processes uh, occurred at that time as a consequence of major economic downturns. Um, and as such, health financing was severely impacted uh, for, uh, for countries, uh, resulting somewhat in uh, the increased, and what we see particularly in the Americas, the degree of segmentation or fragmentation of health systems, and in many cases, the weakening um, of the overall uh, governance capacity of the state within the context of, of health. Within that context, um, PAHO in, in the late 1990s retook the agenda of um, the essential public health functions based on the United States initiative. Um, and we developed a proposal um, around the essential public health functions that was published at the time in what we call the landmark publication of the organization, which is um, Public Health in the Americas. And based on that, we, we carried out over assessments, uh, assessments in, in over 40 countries. The proposal was adopted by the World Bank, by the IDB, um, in, in, in supporting um, agreements and, and development processes across the globe. But what essentially happened then was um, the agenda in global health transitioned. 
it, it transitioned um, a little bit away from the discussion around um, primary health care and, and public health into the discussion uh, around universal health coverage, which was important at the time and, and, can, and remains uh, critically important. Um, and so we saw a building agenda for around financing for, for universal health coverage. We ourselves in the organization um, adopted a strategy on universal access to health and universal health coverage um, to really uh, support countries in transforming health systems to expand access to comprehensive integrated care based on primary health care. Um, and, and this was quite instrumental. We, we've seen over uh, 51 countries in, in, and territories in the region use the strategy to, to, to calibrate, uh, modulate their strategies uh, to expand access and, and coverage um, uh, within health systems. And then, of course, we had the Ebola Zika outbreaks, and that uh, occurred oh, yeah. in 2016, right? Yeah. And this really transformed then. Um, it kind of like shook people in the sense that, hang on a second, there seems to be uh, something somewhat of a myth here, that we need to go back and make sure that we are not siloing our, our, our processes in terms of um, primary health care, in terms of universal health coverage, and, and in terms of public health approaches. And so what we did in the organization was we said, okay, we need to look at the Ebola Zika outbreak and we need to, to integrate universal health coverage into our proposal so that we have one unique proposal that englobes public health within the strategies in which the organization are promoting. Okay, so the, your new proposal is combining, as I put it in short, universal health coverage, the experiences from Zika, plus the good old Alma Ata, let's say, basis. Interesting, uh, you mentioned Zika. Um, Zika was a shake. As you said, we have a worldwide shake now with COVID. And I think that your region, the Americas, is so diverse that it is a great learning ground. You go from small states like Antigua to Brazil, and you have um, different political systems from Cuba to the US. So you can learn from the social determinants and the political determinants of health. What would I um, ask you were your learnings from COVID in the Americas as to what you have explained now on the public health function? We've had, I think, a, um, we've all had a very steep learning curve, um, unfortunately, over the, the last year. Um, the pandemic has clearly impacted health and health outcomes across the world, but particularly so in the Americas. I was just looking at the data yesterday. Um, 62 million confirmed cases in the Americas with 1.5 million deaths. Um, and so this is a real concern. Also, of course, we are reporting in the Americas the highest number of excess deaths of all WHO uh, regions through the indirect impact of the pandemic, particularly due to the impact and the provision of uh, essential health services. A couple of lessons I think that we've clearly seen uh, coming out of the pandemic. First of all, inequalities and inequities. Um, if we look at the inequality gradients in terms of the SARS-CoV-2 transmission rates, um, we see that in lower income populations, uh, indigenous, uh, Latin and Afro-descendant populations, we have um, higher transmission rates um, reported in these groups um, in lower income quintiles. Um, and it, you know, the evidence is very clear in terms of the impact uh, by race and ethnicity. Um, some studies that we've done uh, with WHO essentially shows that disadvantaged groups are more negatively impacted through higher COVID-19 infection rates, worse COVID-19 severity, lack of access to treatments, and higher mortality rates. I mean, it's a perfect storm. Um, and so essentially what COVID-19 um, and I think there's nothing new here, but COVID-19 has really amplified the structural deficiencies that we've seen in our approaches in public health that have resulted um, in highly segmented, fragmented approaches to health systems. 
and it has amplified the existing barriers in access to health, uh, particularly yeah. among vulnerable communities. Yeah, but we have seen the worldwide effect of the magnifying glass of COVID for underlying inequities and problems. Now I am teaching students and um, if these people want to, you know, become good public health professionals, what should they learn and what are the things they could learn and where will they then be active? They see the world is going as it's going. They want to do something. What would you tell them? So I, I would tell them that um, if we look at where we want to be in the future, um, if we want to have a vision uh, whereby we do achieve the sustainable development goals, um, we need to really look at how we recuperate lost public health gains, uh, addressing those health inequities how we can expand access to coverage in health and how we can improve emergency preparedness and response uh, and the future um, against future multi-hazard emergencies and in particular pandemics. And the answers to that um, from my perspective is really beginning to hone in on issues around leadership, uh, stewardship and governance um, within the construct of public health. Um, and so if we if we don't do this, and we've seen that the successes or somewhat of the successes that we have observed during the COVID-19 are principally attributed to strong leadership and governance and the implementation of effective public health measures combined with surging capacity of health systems. What is the role then of public health within this um, um, within this overall strategy moving forward. It essentially means that public health uh, must become a whole of government priority and a whole of society approach uh, to improve the necessary capacities of our health professionals, uh, to implement the policies and strategies required um, to address public health needs and to strengthen institutional structures um, that coordinate across the different public health interventions and programs, right? Um, and, and there, this integrated approach is required, uh, we believe, to enhance, uh, to sustain and to institutionalize mechanisms and capacities on the one hand that will address our health needs in what we've considered more normal times, while having us, uh, providing us the capacity to scale up uh, necessary innovations and capacities in the event of, of emergencies. And this is really, I think, the, the new balance that we need to, to achieve. I think we've somewhat siloed our approaches um, in, in, in our health strategies, uh, be it around approaches um, uh, relating to service provision, our coverage and access, uh, public health and emergency response. And that is not something that can continue. We really need to build this integrated vision um, around the concept of universal health where public health uh, is central to, to our response. So if I hear you then, we have to create leaders that are able to collaborate across and into existing institutions and with the whole community. That's what we need. You know, and that, that is one of the things that we need. Uh, the other things that we need, obviously, are um, the policies and the strategies to, um, to really reach down into the communities um, and to address health needs where people live. Um, in the Americas, we've seen really health systems that have developed around um, hospitals. And we've seen, you know, hospitals being critical to the pandemic response. Um, and that is very important. We've seen surge capacity at the hospital level, but we do run the risk then to say, okay, well, the future of healthcare is essentially through a hospital centric uh, approach. Um, and we need to be careful of that because as we build uh, the necessary capacity in the provision of hospital centric services, we need to be able to shift care into the community through a primary healthcare and a public health approach. That's that's the next point then. 
all these brilliant students that I have who are really passionate and your functions that are quite broad, they kind of clash with what we have as a reality. We have a hospital or a centric, nationalistic, a fragmented system, at least in Switzerland. And I, I'm sure that the power region is not so different. How can we then implement that these people who want to be leaders can do their work? How, how do you see an implementation plan for that? Because we, we want to have it happen, especially now that we have, you know, COVID in front of us and we say it can't be the next time the same thing. And, and here I think this is where we, um, we want to see innovation. Um, we have seen major innovations uh, within the context of COVID-19 in terms of uh, reorganization capacities of, of health services, uh, even in terms of governance and leadership um, in, in management of, of the pandemic, um, in health work for, uh, capacities and, and working conditions, et cetera. So we have seen innovations that I think we need to consolidate. But I think the principal innovation um, that um, the essential public health functions that we are presenting um, relates to um, four key pillars in which we have built the proposal. The first really speaks to around um, the issues of public health values, ethical public health values, uh, whereby we retain a vision whereby we need to address inequities and the root causes. And so the essential functions here can be seen as the capacities um, of the health authorities and civil society to achieve what we call the right to health, which is enshrined in the WHO constitution based on principles of solidarity and equity. That is the first core pillar around which our, our vision is built. The second is really linking them with the social, economic, uh, economic cultural, and, and political uh, determinants uh, of health. Uh, social determinants as the underlying and structural causes of our population's public health. Um, and then at the same time, obviously linking in and, and addressing some of the issues around urbanization, uh, race segregation, income distribution, aging, all these factors that, that impact um, public health. The third pillar, which drives our essential public health functions, is a principle around ensuring universal access uh, to comprehensive integrated uh, health services. These are both individual and population based. Um, and it's ensuring access uh, through public health action, through the leadership and stewardship of, 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 um, uh, of national health authorities and across sectors um, to address um, the needs of the individual, while of course addressing the broader population health needs um, at, a, at a wider level. And then the fourth key pillar, the fourth key innovation that we see uh, in the approach that we, we put forward is really honing in on that issue that I, I mentioned earlier on around governance and stewardship. This cannot happen unless we have effective, strong leaders that have a clear vision um, of the future of public health um, whereby the national health authorities have a clear role, but then there is a much broader uh, role for multi-sectoral action um, to address those determinants that I've mentioned. And so this is really what we're putting forward in terms of the model um, in, in the region of the Americas. This initiative has been built, as I said, over a process uh, dating back to the, what happened in the region uh, in, in Zika, um, we've developed this model and the, and the respective tools for, for, for to guide countries um, through extensive consultations with public health institutions in the Americas, uh, with international experts, uh, with countries, and of course, with, with the broad program areas um, of the Pan American Health Organization. So we, we are quite excited about moving this forward, and I think it is generating a lot of interest also with, with our member states. And thank you for these four pillars and that that puts me to two different questions the one first one is you have developed them for power for the americas should this definition not be a global one that is the um elephant in the room right 
um, we know that um, we, we are aware that, of course, in dating right back to the IOM publication and moving through the Clinton administration, the adoption of the of this CDC Essential Public Health Services, um, right into the resolution of 2016 of WHO, there have been different definitions and different scopes. Um, we see also within the various WHO regions that the approaches to the essential public health functions have been um, distinctive, um, whether it's in Europe or in the Eastern Mediterranean, Mediterranean region or in the Western Pacific region. You know, what we would say is that um, we need to be context specific. Um, we need to, to, to work with countries um, through the various mechanisms um, and the various governing bodies that, that we have to, to really address the context in which we find ourselves. We believe that a, a broader, more expansive vision of public health is required um, as we move forward. Um, that combines this uh, individual and collective action in health um, within the health sector and, and beyond. Um, and we believe this is what PAHO member states have, have asked us to do. And so we look forward as, as this process moves forward to entering into dialogue with, with other regions. We're currently working very closely, for example, with, with the EMRO region um, in supporting some of the some of the discussions ongoing there. Yeah. I just came across because we really know now that health is a global issue and we only can solve issues in health globally. So that was my one question. And the other thing that came up when I listened to the four pillars, let's say, of the essential public health functions. There is the values, that's a societal issue. There is the social, social economic determinants of health, universal access. This is what I would call political agenda. So my question to you would be, how much political competencies should a public health person or professional have or need to have? I think um, in, for us to induce change, um, we need leaders that have the necessary um, political competencies to induce change. Um, that means uh, leaders that have the capacity to bring actors to the table, um, to build that common vision um, around uh, the future of health, um, the future of public health globally, um, and then have, have the leaders that have the capacity to translate that vision into public health action. Um, you know, transforming and inducing change within a health system is a highly, highly complex process with multiple actors uh, from service providers um, to financing agents to the private sector, to academy, to of course civil society groups, each with distinctive uh, visions and interests. And so to, to build that vision, we do really need um, strong leaders that have the vision to know where they, to know where we all want to go, where we need to go. Um, but building that, building participation from the roots up, it's also really important and I think we were discussing uh, recently at, at PAHO the, the issue of community part, social participation, community participation in, in public policy development and, and how complex it can be. Uh, and the role of the leader really is to ensure that, that those processes occur, um, but they, they, they occur within a broader process by which uh, the core mandates um, that are being provided and that vision can be realized uh, including some uh, and some of the contributions coming from civil society, academia, the private sector, and other actors. Yes, that, thank you so much. Yes, I think we are all aware of the fact how difficult it is to induce change in existing health systems um, due to the multiple players and their agendas. And I, I heard you coming back to the social actors that you already mentioned at the very beginning. And I think it's, it's key now to say that it's public's health, it's our health, it's everyone's health. How can we get everyone on board for this so important topic? Get them on board and not leave them, let's say, to the, the populists who will explain them what 
whatever, whatever they know about health or don't know. Do you know what I mean? I do, yeah, I do. You know, we, we have talked uh, also uh, at length with, with the various experts and, and the Institute for Public Health that we've been working with on this proposal and around this issue of how we translate this proposal into um, implementation um, at, the, at the national level. Um, and we actually reverted back to a proposal that was included in the IOM report um, way back when around the policy cycle. Um, now the policy cycle, um, it's same, it may seem very theoretical, but it's essentially applied in, in all countries and all processes, um, uh, really in, in transformation of, of uh, sectoral agendas, including in health. And the policy cycle has four main components. Uh, if we look at it within the context of the essential public health functions. First of all, it's the assessment of population health conditions and determinants. So that the process by which we evaluate. Secondly, it's the policy development process in itself, where we have the necessary capacities to develop and formulate um, inclusive health and social policies. Thirdly, it's the debate around the allocation of resources. So these are essentially the institutional arrangements and mechanisms that will ultimately influence coverage uh, and allocation of resources uh, to the population. And then finally, it's the, the guarantee or the explicit expression to ensure access to comprehensive health, insure, uh, health interventions through those individual and population-based health services and eliminating uh, uh, access barriers. And so using this policy cycle, it's extremely important that we have a participatory approach so that a, a structure and mechanism can be put in place at the national level, um, whereby we have a discussion around these four key areas of the policy cycle uh, to strengthen the essential public health functions. And so what we propose in, in the initiative that, that we launched in, in December is um, that governments essentially um, around this policy cycle initiate a process by which um, a broad team of actors uh, is brought in from across all sectors uh, within a country um, and that these actors begin to map stakeholders and institutions and structures that contribute to, to, to public health. Uh, they review, they do desk reviews of performance and impact reports and they do capacity measurements. And based on that, they, they apply the tool that we have developed to really examine their existing capacities uh, in public health. And based on that existing capacity analysis, we can define the roadmap forward. And, and so it's a kind of a structured process by which we bring down the vision, this broader vision into a process at the national level that allows the multiple actors around the table to move forward in capacity measurements and the development of future roadmaps. Yes, and to, to include all social actors. I think that in the Americas, you do have a lot of countries with very important indigenous populations, for example, or other marginalized populations or difficult to reach populations, populations with varying health literacies. Do you see um, good, good examples of how this could work? That's interesting that you, yeah, that's interesting that you, you, you mentioned the examples. We are currently in the, in the phase of, of rolling this out in a number of countries. Um, and so we've had interesting discussions uh, with some of our countries in really structuring that multi-stakeholder um, uh, entity that, that will, will drive this process under the leadership of, of the national health authorities. Um, bringing some of the actors together is, is challenging. It can be challenging. Um, and making sure that once they're there, that their voices are heard is also challenging. Um, it's particularly important, as you said, in terms of indigenous populations, but also, for example, youth. Um, mm -hmm. The participation in youth in some of our processes, uh, yeah. we often kind of talk about um, uh, children and youth as one of our uh, populations <laughs> within the conditions of vulnerability. But we, on the other hand, we never we never listen to their voices or, or not never, but uh, we, we you know we often say, okay, no, yeah, yeah. But having them participate, you know, we had one experience 
I will talk to is the it was the Commission on Primary Healthcare that we launched uh, a few years back. It was presided by President uh, Michelle Bachelet. Um, yes. And that was an extremely interesting commission because we had people from all sectors, all walks of life, um, from indigenous groups and from youth. And it was fascinating, just it was eye opening for us to particularly listen to the voices uh, of youth within that commission to hear their um, reality, to hear their expression of where they think um, health should go in the future and what their vision of primary health care um, is. And, you know, bringing in the aspects that, that surround their world in terms of digital technologies and, and, and how they interact socially. Um, these were all critical inputs into that process. So it's again, very context specific, um, but challenging. It's, it's challenging. It's a challenging process for national health authorities because it's often easier just to um, drive a process um, based on what governments think is a mandate that they have without being more inclusive in the development of that policy. The risk associated with that is that the policy only lasts the duration of the period of government that you have and is not sustainable beyond that period. There's another important point, yes, to make them lasting and sustainable. But I think the other point that you mentioned there is important too. We have to be humble because we always think we know, but we only know when we listen to others. The fact that we have been one day young doesn't mean that we know. And even if we have children, we don't only know a sample. So uh, experience is not, you have to listen. I like that you underline this fact. And um, I, I think that this is probably also a message for, for all of us in public health. Be humble and listen and take up what people tell you and, um, and put aside your knowledge and just be open, very open and listen. Because I think, as you said, the national contact, the regional contacts, are important and have to be listened to. Uh, I think this, until now, were very interesting inputs. I, I would like to say, first of all, thank you here and go to see what we have as questions to allow our public to ask questions. And I have seen, if I may, a first question from Chile from Dr. Loreto Laval. He says, greetings from Chile. Dr. Fitzgerald, I would like your thoughts on the role that universal health systems have played in managing the pandemic. That is a great question. Um, so I think you between at the beginning, you, you talked about the Americas and how, how different uh, and distinctive our population groups are, countries are even though there is uh, a majority language in terms of Spanish throughout the region. We have the Caribbean, we have Brazil, obviously a, a major Portuguese speaking country. Uh, and each country has different uh, histories and contexts um, that have um, resulted also in very different structures in how health systems have been organized. Um, we have, unfortunately, health systems that are uh, remain highly segmented and fragmented within the region. And we have other systems that are essentially um, more integrated. Um, I, I, have, um, I have a tendency not to talk about universal health systems. Uh, I prefer to talk about universal health as, as an objective and then to look at the degree of uh, cohesiveness and integration in the health system that allow us to get there. Um, and there are three key areas that really determine, I think, um, the capacity of systems uh, to, to realize that vision of universal health. First of all, it's the mechanisms of governance, um, be it within a, a smaller country or a federal country that are structured, organized, um, uh, with uh, defined regulations in terms of the capacity to oversee um, the provision of health services, including the regulation of the private sector. The second, second aspect is, is the financing, the, the degree to which we have either single or multiple um, paying mechanisms within, within a health system. And of course, the third is the, the provider um, to, to, to essentially determine whether we have um, public, uh, public services, either public uh, ministry of health or public security 
combined with, with the private sector. But what I would say to respond to, to the question is that the greater degree of integration we have seen across governance, financing, and services, um, I would argue the more potential we have had to be more effective in the response. Now, I know that is very qualified. Um, and it's qualified because of one thing, the principal determinant that we have seen in terms of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic has been leadership and governance. We have seen highly segmented, uh, fragmented uh, systems that have done reasonably well because of strong leadership and government. We have seen highly well-resourced countries with tremendous resource capacity that have not done well uh, in the COVID-19 response. And we have seen countries with highly integrated health systems that have also not done well. And so there's, a, there's an array of factors there that I think we need to look at. But the principal determinant is really leadership and governance. I would say integration within our health systems and the quest for the, that, that degree of integration towards universal health is a necessary but insufficient condition to respond. What we really need to do is have effective le leadership and governance based on science for us to be able to respond appropriately. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope that Dr. Laval has his answer to his question. And I have the next question that came in from Katarina Sophie Dolleschal. She asks, how can we improve and strengthen mechanisms to share lessons learned between countries, particularly when considering the different health systems and political situations in each country? So you were just about that. So nice follow up questions. What would be your answer? Sharing lessons. How can yeah. we do that? This, this is also really, really important. Um, and I think it's one of our core functions as an organization, as the Pan American Health Organization, as a World Health Organization, to, to promote the sharing of experiences. Um, we have multiple forms by which we, we do that, um, be it through our governing bodies mechanisms, um, in the discussions of, of policy documents, for example. Um, at the moment, we are developing a policy document around resilient health systems. Um, whereby we are looking at the core tenets of uh, what a resilient health system looks like. And we have gone out to consultation with countries um, around that, and we have seen um, very a good degree of alignment, irrespective of the structure of the health system, around the, the areas of work that countries want to share experiences on. One is primary health care to really accelerate the recuperation of, of health losses. The second is strengthening governance for the essential public health functions. That came out very strongly in our consultation. And the third is really on health financing. And so these are, these are key areas, health financing and social protection, I have to say. So these are the key areas by which countries are coming to us and saying, we want to know more, we want to share. There are multiple platforms, I think, also that we need to avail of. You know, our world has been turned upside down in the last year. Um, and why, why most of us, unfortunately, spend all day on Zoom um, and, and, and complain about it. It is, a, it is still a wonderful platform to convene and, and really have experiences shared between countries and, and the dialogue facilitated instead of having to, to travel around the region. That's not to say it's not important to have face-to-face -face contact. It is. But I think we, we really have to avail of all the opportunities, either formal and informal, to share these experiences um, in the development of health systems uh, globally. So you think we have the tools to share our lessons between countries, between ourselves, or we could even do better? I think, I, I was thinking about this, I think there is an enormous amount of evidence out there. Um, we generate so much data, some of it probably insufficiently disaggregated and, and, and not up to date, but there is data out there. There is an enormous amount of evidence that has been produced. I sometimes feel that there is a gap between the translation of that evidence into policy. Um, and that's and, and we should be working in that space. How can we more effectively translate existing evidence um, around what works, what does not work, 
into effective policy. Um, and this comes back to the, the processes by which the essential public health functions have been built on and the, those, those processes at the national level where you, you build a multi-sectoral um, structures to, to, that assist the national health authority to, to define policies and action. I see the, the policy gap. We have still more to do there. I hope that Katarina Sofia Dolasal has her question answered. And I will go to the next question coming from Dr. Amofa. He asks, in or in the middle of increasing insecurity, how do we ensure sustainable health systems, especially in developing countries? Yeah, that's that really is. Um... Uh, is such a critical um, issue and, and a great question. And this speaks to the um, issue of resiliency. Um, I think we need to have a, um, we need to do more work on this issue of, of resilience. Um, we define resilience as the capacity of, this, of, of a health system to surge um, in the context of a multi-hazard emergency. Um, while maintaining existing uh, functions. Uh, and so there's two key parts to that. The, the surge, the reorganization, the adaptive capacity of health systems within a particular context while um, maintaining essential um, services. And if we look at our efforts to date, I think we could say we've been found lacking in both areas. In the capacity to surge, um, it has taken, it took, many of our health systems, a considerable effort to surge. Um, we got there, I believe, in, in many countries. And, and if we look at some of the data coming out from the Americas, um, some of our countries have increased ICU capacity by over 200%. And still, they're at 96% occupancy within the context of COVID-19. Um, but there were major challenges in doing that. Um, so the adaptability. To, to change within health systems has been insufficient and, and that is a critical uh, area. And the other area where we, we continue to struggle is around um, maintaining um, services, including public health services in the traditional context. Um, this could be immunization services, um, maternal child care, uh, even NCDs, HIV, TB. We were looking at some of the data around um, disease control measures in terms of uh, the interruption of services for malaria prevention. And we've seen um, interruptions in these services in the order of 60 and 70% being reported across 24 countries in the Americas. And so our challenge is that, how do we, uh, within a new context, um, a future context, ensure that our future health systems uh, respond to existing needs, have the capacity to search when required, while maintaining the provision of services within that context. Um, there's a lot of work to be done in this area. I, I really feel that. Um, and, and one of the, we see two key attributes as key to, to the response. Um, one is adaptability, and the capacity of systems to adapt. And the second is responsiveness, uh, the ability to, to respond. Um, and around those two, um, we, we then, you know, we see the role of primary health care, the essential public health functions, health financing, et cetera, fit in. But there needs to be a, a broader dialogue around some of the attributes of our health systems uh, to ensure that level of sustainability. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I do have a, an add-up question of uh, Katarina Sofia, if you allow. She said, thank you very much for answering. I would have another question. How can we utilize COVID-19 vaccine introduction to improve primary health care and better reach hard to reach communities with essential health services? Are there already some lessons learned? That's also a, a great question. Um, the deployment of the COVID-19 vaccine was probably the number one challenge we face um, this year, while obviously tackling uh, the continued uh, pandemic. What we did was um, we took an approach whereby we worked with countries on what we call the NVDPs, this is the National Vaccine Deployment Plans. And the National Vaccine Deployment Plans speak to six or seven core areas of work. Um, 
Some are regulatory in terms of the nationalization, the importation requirements, the regulatory requirements for the uh, for the vaccine to, to be uh, imported. Uh, some relate to supply chain conditions, et cetera. But one, one of the key areas of work was around the issue of delivery. And there um, we found that working with countries, countries came up with a multiple variety of strategies um, to ensure delivery of, of vaccines. This could be through mass vaccination um, initiatives, such as we've seen in the US or the UK, or it can be through the delivery of vaccines uh, at the primary care level. Um, I think the given the priority around this, um, countries have really um, prioritized this issue of delivery, not necessarily thinking about its contribution to primary health care. But what I do think we will see now, particularly as we reach uh, in those countries that are beginning to reach uh, high levels of coverage, and it's going to become more difficult to potentially reach the last 20 to 30% yeah. um, for herd immunity, that the role of primary health care is going to be critical. So your regular visits to the doctor where, um, where the COVID-19 vaccine will be offered, uh, potentially community health workers outreach uh, into the communities, uh, into gatherings where people are, uh, offering offering COVID-19 vaccinations. Um, building on the basic opportunities and, and the way we live in order to meet people where they are. And that is one of the core tenets of primary health care. So I do see maybe later on during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and the rollout of vaccines that primary health care will take on a much greater role in this regard. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you so much. I, I see a question here from Patty Randall coming in for more on the economical aspect that you alluded to already, what happened in the 80s. She asks, how can we protect human and planetary health effectively when the UN and others are being told that it is essential to enter partnerships with the world's most dangerous corporations? I think she means um, some of the big companies. What would be your take on this? That is a that is a complex uh, question. Um, I think again, you know, if if we look at the approaches that we we take, um, if we go back to the essential public health functions around the policy cycle, I think there are ways in which we can structure and define our policy objectives, ensuring uh, the necessary consultation um, with all actors, but recognizing the interests of those actors and weighting appropriately uh, contributions uh, along those lines. Um, it's clear that as we develop those, those policy initiatives, um, we have to have a clear, um, we have to have a clear understanding of what the evidence is with regard to the contributions of certain actors um, to health. And, and the evidence is, 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 is there um, and, if, uh, and, and continues to build. And so, um, we need to be very much based on evidence and science as, as we develop um, the policies and, and adjust our, our consultation processes uh, accordingly. Um, I, I don't think I'll speak to the issue of, of you know, how the UN is broadly more dealing with this, um, but I know that there are the necessary um, checks and balances in place. Um, for example, within WHO, uh, the FENSA process, which uh, really regulates how the organization uh, interacts with um, private sector and private sector interests. Um, and we have similar mechanisms across the UN to, to ensure that. Oh, thank you. I think we, we are approaching the end of our hour, but I see the questions are coming in now. So I will perhaps ask you another one, perhaps last one from Chile, from Andrea Basualdo, he says, greetings from Chile. I would like to know how in the future can we give the right information to the public in a more misinformation er era to become? How can this be regulated in order to give the right information to the public? So we are again in the communication question of public health and social media, I think, yeah. and everything else. Yeah, what yeah. would be your take on that? Um, 
I think we need to um, reach uh, reach the right people and have the right people reach um, their their respective social groups. Um, the I, I feel that you know if we look at the issue of vaccine hes hesitancy, um, that as you said earlier on in the conversation, Bettina, it's it's insufficient for an expert to be providing information and for everybody. Uh, it's it's just too simplistic to think that you know the information being provided by an expert will be accepted by everybody. No, that's not what happens. Um, so we need to be able to differentiate. I think our, our communication, our risk communication strategies, um, identify um, those necessary influencers within within society, not just in social media, um, but be it through church groups. Um, uh, social social groups within the communities, social leaders, youth leaders, etc., and begin to be able to have differentiated communication strategies targeted at, at people. The whole issue of uh, social media is highly complex. Um, I don't think you know. I'm not saying anything new to, to say that we don't have a solution for that as of yet. Um, but uh, I do feel that you know we are still in the area in, 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 a, in the early era of, of, of social media. And as digital transformation proceeds within the health sector, um, there will be, I think, some challenges about how we regulate in particular disinformation. We even just saw yesterday in terms of uh, the issues around uh, Facebook, some of the challenges uh, in this yes. regard. And so um, this is really early stage as of yet and it has some way to go. So in summary, I, I don't have a full answer to that. Really, I think and as a public health professional, we really try and target the key actors uh, so that they can talk to the people, their peers, um, and have that discussion and to listen, not just to impart information. Thank you for that. I think we are in the public health field also have to learn from the communication specialist people who know a lot more than, than we do. Um, I see that there are more questions, but I think for, for the sake of time, there has been also a very global question about the strengths of WHO in general and its weaknesses. I think we could continue, but for me, the best webinar is the one that keeps for an hour and does not go longer. But as we see, there is a need for discussion. I hope that our first webinar is only a start of a series and that we continue to work on essential public health functions and how, how to prevent our next pandemic. So my last thing to you would be, how do we best prevent the next pandemic or alleviate because they are coming? Um, I think we need stronger, more resilient health systems. I, need, I think we need to diversify and increase investment in science and technology. And most of all, I think we need uh, to strengthen our leadership and government uh, governance across all uh, sectors in government to realize that without health, you cannot have um, a sustainable and developing economy that will be inclusive for all. So I think these are some of the key messages that we need to move forward. Thank you so much for these, I would call them closing remarks. Thank you, James. Thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald. Thank you to all of those who listened to us, who were online. And thank you also for those who have asked questions. As I said, we are really there for collaboration and continue to work on it. I think we have a lot in front of us to do. Thank you so much. Thank you also to Paho and your other co-workers. Thank you to all. We will be in touch. You can have a look at this webinar again. It will be on our website. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you, Bettina. Goodbye to you and all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.